Happy Sunday, St. James. It is so good to be joining you once again in worship this Sunday. Thank you so much to Donnie for sharing that incredible message this week. And I'm excited for you guys to hear uh, the message that Pastor Jerry has prepared for you today. It's all about joy and it's a great one. I know you're going to enjoy it too. As I was uh, doing my devotion and I was journaling specifically about uh, COVID-19 and about this time, I like to journal um, things that I want to remember as I look back um, over the last couple months and years and uh, some of my thoughts as well as uh, what I hear God sharing with me during this time. And I was kind of smacked over the head. I don't know if this happens to you, but sometimes God kind of puts things repeatedly uh, in my path and it's kind of like some flashers to uh, get me to notice things. And uh, I had one of those moments today and so I just wanted to share it with you. As I was journaling and I was reflecting back, kind of reading back through my journal, um, I had this moment where God was just kind of impressing upon my heart about divine detours. And what I mean by that is sometimes we have these moments in life where things are going along swimmingly. We have this expectation or these best laid plans. And then all of a sudden it's like we hit a brick wall and we have to take this detour um, in what our expectations and what our plans were versus what we're facing in life during that time. I call those divine detours. Um, but it's these moments that God uses, these interruptions that we have in our life that God uses uh, for his plan and for his purpose in our life. And I felt like we all are experiencing one of those right now. We were going along and then all of a sudden we are now self-isolating and quarantining and um and God, I feel, at least for me in my life, is using this as an opportunity to speak to me and to move me in different ways. And I know and I'm sure that he's doing that for you too. Um, the verse that kept coming up for me today is Proverbs 19, 21. And this is what it says. Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. So my challenge for you today and my word of encouragement is this. I pray that you would see this divine detour, this interruption in your life, um, not as a distraction, uh, but as an opportunity for God to move mountains in your life, in your neighborhood, in our community, in our church, in our nation, and that we would see this as an opportunity to join God in his plan and his purpose for us. And so I pray that you will just take a moment to listen for that still small voice and what God might be asking you to step into during this season. It might be something as simple as reaching out to someone, putting others first, um, or it could be something big. It could be starting a new ministry opportunity. What is he asking us to stop? And what is he asking us to step into? We love you, church. We miss you terribly. We're continuing to pray for you, and we hope that we will be able to join you in person soon. I hope you enjoy Pastor Jerry's message, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Bye. Good morning, St. James Brethren Church, or afternoon or evening. That's the neat thing about online church. You can go at your convenience. Glad to be with all of you today. You know, most of us uh, didn't know the term COVID-19 just a few months ago or even novel coronavirus. But then a few months ago, uh, the world as we know it, life as we would call normal, changed suddenly and swiftly. It changed communities around the world, and we're all fighting together this invisible hidden enemy, COVID-19. That enemy has endangered the, the health and well-being and livelihood of billions of people, as well as our own community. It's wreaked havoc with businesses of every size, uh, threatening the global economy. But as such, this is the most singular and collectively disruptive moment of our lifetime as it is for most of the world. We're feeling it right here, right now. There are many facing uh, loss of jobs and their livelihood in our own community, perhaps in our church community. 
Uh, many are stressed to keep food on the table to pay the bills. Uh, it's interesting that at home, uh, parents with school-aged children have taken on not just the role of parent, but the role of home school teacher, as well as many at the same time are doing their own jobs from the home. And this has really put additional responsibilities and strain and stress into our daily schedules for many of you. I was amused by one story I saw uh, about a young girl in her home saw her mother talking to herself. And of course, this mother was involved in teaching her children as well as doing her job from home. So the, the little girl asked, Mommy, why are you talking to yourself? And she said, well, honey, I'm having a parent-teacher conference. Well, that's uh, the way things are these days. Uh, I've heard spouses say mm, their relationship is being challenged a little bit, being right under each other's noses all day long. But I hope you're doing well. Hope you're coping. Well, we're all taking on different roles. We're in a more compacted situation. We're closer in with one another. Uh, but this this season will pass. Uh, one of my favorite phrases uh, with our family as we were going through challenges, this too will pass. But right now, uh, we're in the midst of it. And I began to think, why why am I going to talk about happiness at a time where I think it's challenging to having a joyful spirit and, and to be happiness? It's not, it's not the best of times. Uh, I had planned on doing a talk on happiness because of some, some situations and, and things that I've heard over the years from Christians about the idea of happiness. But I thought, well, you know, while we're in this confined situation and maybe our joyfulness and our happiness is under siege a bit, maybe it's a good time to talk about it. So today, I'd just simply like to share a few thoughts with you about happiness and just let those sink in, whatever the Holy Spirit has for you through this message. We submit that to him. Well, why would I talk about happiness now? Well, you know, sometimes when we're in crisis, it helps to sharpen uh, our minds to what really matters. Darker times also help to shed light on what we value. It kind of magnifies it. Uh, crisis times clarify meaning and purpose in our life because we have to take a step back and look. What what do we value and what has meaning and purpose? What gives meaning and purpose to our life? And sometimes it's the darkness that makes us appreciate the light more. So I'm going to talk about happiness today, and I don't mean to to ignore, deny, or demean the situation that we're going through. But, you know, happiness is almost the the eternal state of our life. Yes, there are going to be tough times. As the, the, the phrase goes, uh, some rain falls in our life, and we're kind of in a time of rainfall. But happiness and joy, that's a part of our life is followers of Jesus. So three things that I just simply want to leave some thoughts with you on today. Uh, one is the, the myth of joy and happiness. Some, I believe, false teaching that has been prominent in, in the last 100, 150 years within Western Christianity. So the myth of joy and happiness. Then talk about the source of happiness and the benefits of happiness. But let me start with uh, principle number one, which uh, counters the myth that there is a difference between joy and happiness. And in fact, some teach and believe God doesn't necessarily want us to be happy and that there is a difference and even some say an opposition between joy and happiness. I don't think so. Biblically, and I've studied this for a number of years, there's no distinction between joy and happiness uh, and the Bible. And there are families of words. If, if you're a, a, a student or a professor of language, you would talk about semantic domains. In other words, change of synonyms that have the same meaning. And this is what we have in scripture. We have words like joy, happiness, gladness, pleasure, delight, merriment, even felicity, Feliz Navidad, happy Christmas, enjoyment, rejoice, blessed. These uh, school or family of words together are synonyms for joy and happiness in the scripture. 
Well, two false claims are, are often made, and I hear this in teaching. I hear this from, from pastors, uh, and I just think it's, it's, it's wrong and gives a wrong perspective on what it is to be a follower of Jesus. False claims that I hear taught, one, there's a false contrast between joy and happiness. And secondly, some teach that God really isn't interested in our happiness and doesn't want us to be happy. Well, John Piper uh, writes, if you have nice little categories for joy is what Christians have and happiness is what the world has, you can scrap those when you come to the scriptures because the Bible is indiscriminate in its use of the language of happiness and joy and contentment and satisfaction. They really uh, are words that are of that family of chain that are synonyms that have the same meaning. In fact, what I'm telling you is that there is no difference in Scripture between joy and happiness. Here's, here's an example, and understand I am quoting now kind of a, a sense of what has been taught, and I'm saying this is not really a biblical perspective on joy and happiness, but this is often what you will hear. Joy is something entirely different from happiness. Joy in the biblical context is not an emotion. Joy brings us peace in the middle of the storm. Joy is something that God deposits into us through the Holy Spirit. There's a big difference between joy and happiness. Happiness is an emotion and temporary. Joy is an attitude of the heart. Now, there are some things in that statement that are true, but this comes out of the context of one who is preaching and teaching that uh, joy is for us, happiness is for the world, and happiness is a secondary and less valuable emotion or feeling. But I just want to uh, proposition that in Scripture this isn't true. There is harmony in joy and happiness taught in the Scripture. The scripture uses joy and happiness interchangeably. Over a hundred times, joy and happiness are referred together in the same sentence or the same verse. And many scriptures talk about God and happiness, God as happy and him desiring our happiness. So these, these myths, uh, I think we should, we should get perspective on them. It's okay as a Christian to have happiness and to be happy, and to pursue happiness, and really to have an expectation for joy and happiness. Now, I'm going to use the words interchangeably, because from Scripture, they really mean the same thing. Again, over a hundred times, we have verses in the Scriptures that use happiness or happy and joy in the very same uh, sentence or the very same verses. Those Scriptures demonstrate, I think, that there's a close relationship biblically between joy and happiness. They're really synonyms. Uh, so the scriptures that I'm going to read to you, I'm just picking out a selection of, of the over 100. I think they refute this false claim that the Bible first does not talk about happiness and the fact that joy and happiness have contrasting meanings, some even saying an opposite meaning. But let me just uh, read a sample of some scriptures that I selected out of the 100. It almost seems like it would have been a good idea. Just read the 100 and let that be the sermon for the day. But let me let me read you some. Uh, first from uh, Psalm 68, 3. May the righteous be glad and rejoice before God. May they be happy and joyful. Uh, from Esther 8, 16. For the Jews, it was a time of happiness and joy, gladness and honor. Uh, this is what the Lord Almighty says from Zechariah eight nineteen: The fast will become joyful and glad, occasions and happy festivals for Judah. Uh, Psalm eighty nine fifteen: Happy are the people who know the joyful shout, Yahweh, Lord, they will walk in the light of your presence. Uh, from uh, Ecclesiastes 9, 7, eat your food with joy and your wine with a happy heart, for God approves of this. Uh, from Isaiah 65, 18, be glad, rejoice forever in my creation. And look, I will create Jerusalem as a place 
of happiness. Her people will be a source of joy. Everlasting happiness will be on their heads as a crown. They will be glad and joyful. There will be no sorrow or grief. There will be happiness. That's Isaiah 35.10. You, O Lord, have made me happy by your work. I will sing for joy because of what you have done. Uh, just another one or two uh, from Acts 2.46, which Acts 2.42 to 47, I think, gives us a very uh, succinct statement of the purpose of and vision of the church. But the believers ate together in their homes, happy to share their food with joyful hearts. Hannah prayed, the Lord has filled my heart with joy. How happy I am because of what he has done. So you see, there are just many verses that bring joy and happiness together that refute this claim that they're different and happiness is not in the vision, so to speak, for the follower of Jesus. But those are just some of the, the scriptures that I think refute the claim. And some feel, well, it's almost, uh, if not evil, kind of profane that we seek happiness. But God does want us, I think, to be happy and to have joy. You know, an analogy that works for me, because I know there are times in this coronavirus may be a challenge uh, to your spirit, to your joy, and to uh, your happiness at the moment. Uh, it's it's causing us not to be together with with one another is the the body of Christ with family uh, and with friends. But again, I know that we're going to get through it. But every day the sun shines. Now, Sherry and I lived in Oregon for 15 years where it averages 262 days a year of cloud cover with drizzle and light rain. And a lot of people don't do well in that. But the sun shines every day. The sun shines seven days a week, 365 days a year. So there's always sunshine. And I think for the Christian, the analogy is there's always a foundation, a threshold, an attitude of heart and mind, of joy and happiness. The sun shines every day, but some days just above the clouds. And right now, this is a cloudy season. Uh, below, uh, the clouds are here, obscuring the sun, Maybe our joy and happiness are a bit diminished by our circumstances. Yet we do know that there is a threshold uh, for us as believers. There is a solid ground for our joy and for our happiness. And there are circumstances in life, certainly, that bring us down and, and bring anguish and bring, bring grief. We don't deny that. But for the believer... And for people created in the image of God, the desire is that there be a happy and joyful life. So the myth, I believe, goes away when we closely examine in scriptures. Joy and happiness are the same. Next, let me just talk about the source uh, of happiness. And you know, in real estate, it's location, location, location. But when we talk about happiness and the source of happiness, it's relationships, relationships, relationships. What brings a good life? What brings a happy life? You know, a recent uh, survey of, of millennials, some younger people, asked them, what, what is a good life that you're seeking? What are your goals? What do you want for happiness in your life? 80% of them said to get wealthy, to get rich. And 50% of those said not only to be wealthy and rich, but to be famous and to have fame. Well, does that really bring fulfillment? It's not that we, we do not want to uh, grow in the, the uh, giftedness that God has given us. And we may gain some fame. We may gain some wealth. But will that bring fullness of life? Will that make a good life? Will that make a happy life? Well, you know, uh, Ecclesiastes 2, 1 through 11 does address this area. It talks about uh, Solomon's pursuit of all kinds of things to bring fulfillment, to bring happiness. Uh, but it kind of concludes with verse 11. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, Everything was meaningless, the chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained after the sun. 
So what brings a good, happy life? And I believe this is so biblical. It's relationships, relationships, relationships. And I believe we can premise from the scriptures that healthy relationships are the source of joy and happiness. Money, wealth, fame, position, achievement, they don't do it. Yeah, they contribute to our lives. But what really gives us happiness and joy? Well, first, I think the relationship with God for the believer is our source of joy and happiness. Uh, Psalm 68, 3. May the righteous be glad and rejoice before God. May they be happy and joyful. Other scriptures, uh, Psalm 89, 15 again. I read this earlier, but happy are the people who know the joyful shout, Yahweh. Psalm 32, 11, rejoice in the Lord and be happy. You who are godly, shout for joy. First Peter 1, 8 from the New Testament. Uh, you don't see Christ now, but you believe in him. You are very happy with joy and praise. And secondly, healthy relationships with God and others are the source of happiness and joy. Proverbs 17, 22, a general maxim of truth, a cheerful heart is good medicine. Acts uh, 2, 46 again, the believers ate together in their homes, happy to share their food with joyful hearts. Okay, we can't do that right now, but that day will come again. Proverbs 14, 27, the fear of the Lord is the fountain of life so that one may avoid the snares of death. And that passage has a meaning from what I'm going to share with you now about one study that was done over a period of years about joy and happiness. And also, I think that the power of joy and happiness comes from relationships and it comes from the one another's that we're given. There are 42 of them in the New Testament, but love one another, be devoted to one another, live in harmony with one another, accept one another, greet one another, uh, carry the burdens of one another, be patient with one another, be kind to one another, be compassionate uh, to one another, encourage one another, build up one another, and of course, pray for one another. You know, as I studied the one another's, I realized you could take all the scriptures out about relationships other than these 41 or two one another's, even take out the passages about uh, how to have a, a happy and functioning marriage. And the one another's are enough to live a life with successful, fulfilling relationships. Well, the study I wanted to mention to you, because it really reaffirms the biblical principles of joy and happiness. Uh, most studies that are done on happiness and what is the, what is a good life don't last more than 10 years. They either run out of funding or they just fizzle out or, or the, the researchers get on to something else and drop the study. But there's one that's remarkable. It's called the, the Harvard Study of Adult Development. The Harvard Study of Adult Development. This one began in 1938, and it continues today. It's an amazing thing. Uh, today, Dr. Robert Waldinger of Harvard University is uh, head of this study. He's the fourth person to lead and coordinate this study. It began in 1938, so it's 82 years old. And the question was, what makes for a happy life? What makes for a good life? And so the people were uh, questioned and surveyed every two years, and they followed their lives. Now, many of those from 1938 have died, but the study is passed on to their spouse or, or to their children. So this is a remarkable study in that we've been able to track a number of lives for 82 years with that question of what makes a happy life. So we learn from their experience and from what uh, the researchers were able to observe. So uh, they tracked 724 men uh, starting in 1938. Half of the men were from Harvard College, it was called at that time. The other half were some uh, of the poorest neighborhoods of uh, Boston. So we had two cohorts in this study. Uh, half of them were sophomores at Harvard College. The other half were some uh, men 
from the most difficult, challenging, poor uh, districts of Boston. So they tracked these uh, 724 men. Some of them became lawyers, some became bricklayers, some became factory workers, some became doctors, and one even became a U.S. president who was a part of this study. Some of these men developed alcoholism. Some even developed mental illness, including schizophrenia. And the differentiation wasn't whether they were the Boston group, uh, men from uh, poor communities, or the sophomores from Harvard. So these were 18, 19-year-old men who started out for this study, and it went on. It is at the second year. Well, some uh, did develop uh, uh, other issues that were debilitating to their lives and to relationships. Some climbed the social ladder from the very bottom to the top. Some at the top of the social ladder went the opposite direction and went down to the bottom in their life. But one thing that the study does show is that wealth, fame, working hard does not necessarily lead to a happy life. So what are the, the conclusions uh, to this study? Well, first, the conclusion, and remember, this study is 82 years old, 724 people's lives studied. One, good relationships make us happier and healthier. Those who were more connected to, to family, to friends, and in many cases to their church family as well as to their community, were healthier, happier, and lived longer. Uh, the study also, in contrast, showed that loneliness kills. Loneliness is toxic. Uh, people who live a life that is lonely, their health declines earlier. They tend to live shorter lives. Their brain function declines earlier. And this is something to take note of because one in five Americans at any time surveyed say that they are facing loneliness. And so we have a lot of lonely people. And right now that may be a challenge for some because they're living a lonely life under the conditions that we are right now. The stay at home order, uh, the social distancing. But it's the quality of relationships, secondly, not the quantity, nor being in a committed relationship. And what that means is you don't have to be a married person to have a life fulfillment uh, through relationships because single people have uh, relationships with people in, in the community. But number one uh, uh, observation and conclusion from the study is healthy relationships make for a happy, healthier life. And secondly, it's not how many relationships we have. It's the quality of the relationships that we have. Uh, we know that living in, in, in chronic conflict is bad for health. Uh, we need good, warming, accepting relationships because they're protective. And that's the body of Christ. All of the commands to love one another and so on uh, are protective in relationships. Uh, good, warm, accepting relationships, protected. But what this study showed that at age 50, the best predictor of the quality of life or of happiness at age 80 was not cholesterol. It was the satisfaction of living in good, healthy relationships. God's design for us, so biblical. So at age 50, the quality of relationships, the best predictor of longevity, is quality, healthy relationships. Good relationships, the study found, protect our body and our brains. Uh, they help buffer us from the, the slings and arrows of growing old. Uh, people in good, secure, warm, protective relationships in their 80s have better memories and sharper minds, the study found. Thirdly, the study just confirmed that notion that no fame, wealth, high achievement, don't do it. It's relationships. And this is, this is so biblical. And it goes back to the myth that there is a difference between joy and happiness. 
God is about joy and happiness. Again, not denying that there are harder times in life. There are losses and grief that we face. But on the horizon of eternity, we have an eternal joy and happiness. And that was intended not just for the heavenly life, but the life here on earth. And finally, one thing, the benefits of happiness. And again, happiness, the source of happiness is good relationships. In John 10, 10, Jesus said, I came that you could have life and that you would have it more abundantly. And that word for abundantly is parisos, a life so far beyond what we could imagine, the goodness of God in our lives. Uh, and in contrast to that verse, it starts out that the thief only comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And there are things in life that threaten us, that do steal, kill, and destroy. COVID-19 is really challenging uh, our psyches, our mindsets, uh, our outlook on life. Uh, it is an enemy. It steals, it kills, it destroys. But Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and have it abundantly. So simply to conclude, biblically as well as from that uh, Harvard study on adult development, the benefits of happiness, one, health and well-being. Secondly, contentment and satisfaction in life. Thirdly, meaning and purpose in life. And fourth, actually, longer life. And fifth, joy and happiness. So the benefits of happiness, which comes from good, healthy relationships, are health and well-being, contentment and satisfaction in life, meaning and purpose, a longer life, and joy and happiness. I don't know where all you are today. We're in different places in our spiritual journeys and our life journeys. But here's some action steps I would separate, I would recommend to you. One, maybe for some of you, you need to take an action step of replace some screen time with people time. Maybe that's your challenge. Especially to younger people, I would say relationships are what is going to give your life purpose, meaning, joy, and happiness. So we all have our screen time, but maybe some of you could use less. Secondly, if you're finding yourself in a stale relationship, do something new together that can instill some life into a relationship to help renew it. Thirdly, reach out to family members that you might be estranged from. Family feuds take a huge toll on those who hold grudges. So again, to repeat, I think a biblical premise and the premise that came from the study a healthy life is built on warm, secure, loving relationships. Quality relationships give purpose and meaning to life. God, family, one another. And yet it discourages me to see in our culture just too many Christians are perceived as angry, judgmental, and critical. People who don't seem to derive any joy from life whatsoever. So why aren't they happy? Why aren't some of us happy? Well, I think unfortunately it started out with many Christians being taught this uh, early myth that God doesn't necessarily want us to be happy, just wants us to be holy, which he does. In fact, many Christians, I think, are laboring under the, the false uh, premise uh, that God himself is not happy that he's stern and stoic, holding his cane, just looking to see you get out of line and whack you. That's not a biblical view of our God. The Bible is filled with verses that prove that ours is to be a happy, joy-filled life, and that God is a happy, joy-filled God, who not only loves celebration, but I think he desperately wants his children, you and I, to be happy. Why else would he go to the lengths he did to ensure our eternal happiness in his presence? Because we know that someday we will experience the unimaginable joy and happiness of heaven. But that doesn't mean we can't also experience joy and happiness here on earth. 
So in this time of coronavirus and COVID-19, our time of staying at home, of social distancing, let's make it a time to take stock of our relationships. A happy life is built on good, warm, secure, loving relationships. Quality relationships give purpose and meaning to life. God, family, one another. If you'd like to go further in this study, the best book out there is Randy Alcorn's book, simply titled, Happiness. Father, thank you for today. And as we endure these times that challenge us, that have altered our lifestyle, Lord, we pray that we would find that sustained joy and happiness that we can have only in you and in our love with one another and for one another. Amen.